Okay, welcome everybody to the Asia Pacific Analysis MPD seminar. It's today, it's a great pleasure for me to see so many attendees in our seminar, and it's a great pleasure for me to have Felix Otter from the Max Planck Institute in, in Leipzig as a, as a guest. Professor Otto obtained his PhD at the University of Bonn in 1993 under the supervision of Stefan Luckhaus. From there, Professor Otto was, a, a, he, after this, from 1995 to 1996, Professor Otto was a visiting scholar at Courant Institute, in, and in 1996 he went to, as a postdoctoral associate at Carnegie Mellon University, and then returned again back as a postdoctoral associate at the Courant Institute. In 1997, Professor Otto obtained his first tenure track position as an assistant professor at the University of California at Santa Barbara, where he got promoted also as full professor in 1998. From 1999 to until 2010, Professor Otto held a professorship at the University of Bonn. And since 2010, he is a director of the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics and Science. Professor Otto, thank you so much for um, giving, uh, for presenting your recent results on um, in optimal transport on regularity theory. And uh, please start. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for uh, the kind invitation to this uh, uh, Asia Pacific seminar. It's a pleasure to uh, to be with you. Um, so this is uh, this is work. Uh, uh, started, I started with Michael Goldman, who uh, was postdoc in Leipzig uh, a while ago, and then uh, I'm mostly reporting on joint work with him and Martin Hussmann, but there are extensions with uh, Tatsuya Miwa, who is back in, who was postdoc in Leipzig, is back in Tokyo, and uh, Maxime Prodom and Tobias Ried, which probably I will not have the chance to say much about. So, um, I will start with one slide, which uh, um, kind of is more for the senior people, which tells you in one, on one slide what the big message is or what the message is, the main message is. And then I will start explaining, reminding you of what optimal transportation is, what, uh, uh, what the mont ampere equation is, and uh, uh, we'll go a bit, uh, a bit more slow. But uh, uh, the main... Uh, uh, the main message of um, uh, of this talk or the work, perhaps, is that uh, when it comes to optimal transportation, uh, one can essentially follow uh, the Georgie's strategy uh, for minimal surfaces. So one can really treat it completely as a variational problem and approach uh, questions of regularity, at least some questions of regularity, completely in that framework. So. Uh, uh, so what I will stress, and again, this is for the experts, uh, is the principle of harmonic approximation. So the fact that uh, 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 we can um, kind of approximate uh, um, uh, optimal transportation by, by a problem uh, uh, which, uh, which involves harmonic functions. And then uh, this feeds in into what uh, some people will know from minimal surfaces, uh, Kind of good regularity theory for harmonic functions, uh, change of variables, uh, uh, one-step improvement, Campanato iteration, epsilon regularity, partial regularity. And uh, uh, what we will obtain this way is uh, uh, a Schauder type of regularity result, uh, a C2 alpha regularity result for what is called the Kantorovich potential in optimal transportation for the convex function psi, I will remind you of that, what that is, which means a C1 alpha regularity for uh, the map, the Bonnier map. And so much of this is actually not new in terms of final results. So I think the main innovation is in the approach. And as I said, the approach is uh, purely variational. So we'll never use uh, uh, in fact, the Euler-Lagrange equation will never use uh, maximum principle. So in a certain sense, it completely circumvents the uh, celebrated theory from uh, Luis Caffarelli, which he started develop developing in the, uh, in the 90s. Okay, so there will be a kind of uh, old, semi-new and new applications, which I will touch upon. But in principle, my main 
objective for this talk is to uh, show you this, uh, this different approach uh, uh, to, uh, to similar results. Okay, so now, now this was uh, kind of uh, uh, the bottom line for, uh, for experts or senior people. Now let me uh, uh, become slow and start uh, uh, telling you or reminding you, I guess, uh, what optimal transportation is. So uh, uh, optimal transportation relates uh, uh, to uh, non-negative measures, let's call them mu and nu, uh, lambda, uh, which have the same mass, uh, uh, which may be, have, you know, may be given by density with respect to Lebesgue measure or may have singular parts. And, uh, and in a certain sense, we want to uh, transport uh, uh, the mass, uh, which is described by the one density, so all the little particles uh, which make up this density into uh, the positions uh, 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 described by this density. And we want to do it in a, we want to do this shipping in, in the cheapest possible way. And the um, kind of most robust formulation of that problem is U2 Kantorovich and is formulated on the level of transfer or transference plans pi. So those are probability measures or non-negative measures uh, on the product space x, y, uh, which have the property that if you integrate out the second variable, you get the first measure. And likewise, if you integrate out the first variable, you get the second measure. So probabilists would say, you look at all couplings of the two measures, uh, or you look uh, at kind of this measure, which has marginals, uh, mu and lambda. That's a little bit the jargon. So, uh, so that's an admissible transfer plan. And now you want to do it in a certain sense, the cheapest way. And what you want to minimize is the square of the Euclidean distance between the points where the mass particle originally was and where the mass particle ends up with. So you want to min minimize the cost functional, which uh, consists of integrating uh, the square Euclidean distance against pi and, uh, uh, and that's, the, that's the problem of optimal transportation in the uh, Mange, uh, in the Kantorovich formulation. And, uh, and in fact, uh, the minimum is uh, the square of what is sometimes called the Wasserstein distance. It's a metric. Loosely speaking, it, it's a metrization of the uh, uh, um, topology of weak convergence. And uh, it's... Uh, in, in, in stochastic language, it means coupling the two random variables, uh, which are described by the distributions mu and uh, lambda in such a way that you maximize the, uh, the covariance. So it's very natural from many areas in mathematics, it's a very natural uh, uh, variational problem. So that's optimal transportation in the uh, Kantorovich formulation. So here again, uh, I uh, wrote down what this uh, variation problem is. And uh, now uh, there is, uh, like in all variation problems, there is kind of a first order criterion, an optimal, uh, uh, um, uh, an Euler-Lagrange equation. Here, uh, uh, one approach to getting there is the following. So uh, it's uh, actually a rather soft result, convex analysis result that any optimal transport plan pi will be concentrated, the support will be restricted to uh, uh, the subgradient of a convex function psi. That's the so-called Kantorovich potential. So uh, uh, another way of saying that is that this, uh, 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 the support of pi in the product space of xy, it's what's called cyclically monotone. And uh, so that's, uh, that's in a certain sense a soft way of expressing the Euler-Lagrange equation. Now, if you, Combine that with the statement that um, uh, uh, the transport plan has marginals uh, mu and let's say the Lebesgue measure for simplicity, uh, then uh, this can be written in the following weak, weak form, uh, namely the push forward of mu under the derivative, the gradient of psi, which we know by Rademacher exists uh, almost uh, everywhere, that the push forward is given by, uh, uh, leads, leads to the Lebesgue measure. And now if on the right hand side, you use the transformation uh, uh, formula, um, then uh, you read off 
from this uh, from this weak formulation, uh, if everything is smooth, uh, this partial differential equation, um, which reads that the uh, uh, consider this convex potential psi, consider its Hessian, so the matrix of second derivatives, look at its determinant, and then this determinant has to be equal to mu. And that's an instance of the mont pair equation. So uh, loosely speaking, you may say that the uh, Euler-Lagrange equation of optimal transportation is the mont pair equation. And now the mont pair equation, when it comes to the regularity, that's uh, uh, a classical, uh, a crucial uh, equation because um, the mont pair equation is kind of a prime example of a fully nonlinear elliptic equation in the sense you can write it uh, uh, you can say it's characterized by, uh, by a function f, which lives on matrix space, so more precisely on the space of uh, positive definite and symmetric matrices, and it's given by the determinant minus 1, and you want to solve f of the Hessian of psi is equal to 0. So it takes this form of a fully nonlinear elliptic equation, fully nonlinear equation. In fact, it's elliptic. It has this uh, uh, monotonicity property, which means uh, you can work with comparison principles. So that's uh, kind of the main tool there. But then uh, it's, uh, in fact, it's fairly degenerate elliptic. It uh, kind of degenerates if you, uh, if your matrices uh, kind of get to the boundary of the set where they're positive definite. So when they become almost just positive semi-definite and this degeneracy is kind of the reverse of the metal that the equation is in fact affine invariant. It has a non-compact uh, invariance group, which is very different from the standard elliptic equation, the Laplace equation, which is invariant with respect to uh, the compact group of uh, uh, rotations. And now, uh, now Caffarelli's breakthrough was, I mean, that was a well-studied equation, but I think his main, uh, his main uh, crucial contribution is by him, which shows that in a certain sense, these elements, kind of the comparison principle and the uh, uh, affine invariance with smart use of compactness arguments give you uh, kind of the initial regularity which you need to kind of bootstrap and get it into the uh, machinery. So, so in that sense, uh, the mont pair equation, optimal transportation is, is, is interesting from the point of regularity theory because it's, it's, it's at the crossroads of two different directions, either kind of the fully nonlinear world uh, or the variational world. And here I want to stress the second, uh, uh, the second approach to, uh, to regularity. So, but before doing so, let me say that regularity is interesting for, the, uh, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for optimal transportation because there is uh, almost a folklore example uh, which tells you that uh, even if the data is are smooth, so even if uh, 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 these measures mu and lambda have smooth densities, uh, there is no need uh, for the solution, so for the uh, gradient of this Kantorovich potential or for the Brunier map T to be smooth. And, uh, and so this is more thinking in terms of characteristic functions, so kind of transporting a domain into another domain. Uh, if you, uh, if you want to kind of transport uh, uh, the ball into uh, kind of the split ball and remove the two halves, it's clear that this has to be discontinuous, but then it's not so difficult to see that if you kind of uh, uh, make the image connected and completely smoothly bounded, this still has to be discontinuous. So, uh, so it's not true that smooth data automatically lead to a smooth solution. And in, uh, in the Riemannian case, uh, there are other reasons for, uh, for, for, for non-smoothness and, uh, and there is a well-developed uh, regularity approach in that, in that more general case too. So, so seeing the fact that, that, there, um, that generically uh, there are singularities, uh, something which is called epsilon regularities of interest. So, Epsilon regularity is kind of a jargon in regularity theory, which just tells you that provided in a certain sense, your solution is in the right non-dimensional way, sufficiently small, then the smoothness of the data transmits to the smoothness of the solution. That's in a nutshell what epsilon regularity is, and it's a concept that's used in, a, in kind of 
uh, uh, all kind of nonlinear elliptic and parabolic problems. So here, epsilon regularity would state that if in a certain non-dimensionalized uh, uh, sense, the uh, transportation distance is already below a threshold, then uh, smoothness of the data translate into smoothness of the solution. And, uh, uh, and that's exactly what, uh, 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 that's exactly the type of regularity theory I would like to talk about. And uh, as opposed to what's um, done uh, uh, in, 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 in the existing literature, uh, which takes more this fully nonlinear uh, Caffarelli uh, type uh, approach, uh, uh, I want to kind of tell you about this uh, somewhat orthogonal approach, which works by harmonic approximation, very much like in the minimal surfaces. So, uh, so the way we're going to, eps to get epsilon regularity is by a statement of this type. If in a certain non-dimensionalized non sense, the, uh, um, uh, the transportation distance is small, and if the densities are close to constant, and without loss of generality, I can set that constant equal to one, then the displacement, so the vector field by which you move your particles, uh, so y minus x integrated against the uh, transport measure, is close to the gradient of a harmonic uh, uh, function. And uh, uh, so that's the type of, uh, that's the type of statement uh, uh, I, want to, uh, I want to tell you about. So on the next slide, I will give you uh, 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 this uh, somewhat technical uh, looking result about harmonic approximation, uh, um, which is at the core of uh, our path to epsilon regularity, and, uh, but which I think is of independent interest. And uh, so uh, I will give it, it's a somewhat busy slide, but I will walk you through and you'll see it uh, a couple of times. So, uh, um, so it's a local result, like uh, kind of uh, approaches to uh, epsilon regularity are typically kind of are typically local approaches. So we define something like a, a local energy. So uh, 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 let's say in the ball of radius six. So of course by an rescaling non-dimensionalization, you can set this uh, ball to uh, order unity, and six is of course, a little bit arbitrary, but six is larger than one, and in the end, we get a statement on a ball of radius one. So, in uh, in um, in this type of cross in uh, uh, in the uh, uh, product space in the x y space, we suppose that the displacement uh, um, we control the displacement, and that's what we call the the local energy, and that's what we impose to be small, and we uh, impose that the local data are small in the sense that they're close to constant. So again, with loss of generality, close to the constant one. And we measure that in the right intrinsic way. So we look at the Wasserstein distance, in fact, the squared Wasserstein distance, since we have squares everywhere, uh, between uh, the initial measure mu and a constant kappa, which we impose to be close, or which we monitor to be close to one. But otherwise, the measure mu could be completely singular. It could be purely atomic, if you want. And we have the same quantity for the target measure lambda. So then the statement is a typical uh, epsilon threshold statement. So for any um, uh, small number tau, uh, there exists a threshold epsilon, which only depends on tau and the dimension and a constant, which has the same property such that if the local energy and the local data term are below this threshold epsilon, then there exists a harmonic gradient uh, in such a way that the displacement is close to the harmonic gradient and much closer than the size of the energy itself. So, uh, so the tau, in a certain sense, stands for the noise to signal ratio. You want this expression which is kind of a variant of the energy, you want this expression to be much smaller than the energy, right? You want to gain something from comparing with the harmonic gradient. And this is why this proposition takes this form for any tau. Think of it as being small, one over a million. 
uh, there exists uh, a threshold so that there exists a harmonic gradient of which you control the Dirichlet energy so that you, uh, you get below tau times epsilon plus C times the data term. So in this sense, uh, we show that if we're in the small energy, small data regime, uh, the displacement in fact indeed is close to, uh, to a harmonic gradient. And uh, uh, now let me comment on this uh, a little bit more. So you'll see that on the uh, next slide again. So here's the definition of the uh, local energy because um, what's important about this statement is that in a certain sense, it has the correct homogeneities uh, in the sense that uh, uh, on the right-hand side, you don't just have tau times the energy, but you also have a constant times d, d to the power one. So, uh, uh, and that's what you, that's what you uh, in a certain sense, would like to have that uh, um, the, uh, uh, the, the energy, which is in a certain sense quadratic in the solution, the data term, which is the square of the Wasserstein distance, or also some quadratic quantities, that you have these homogeneities, right? That in this line, all the quantities in a certain sense are of quadratic type. And uh, that makes it, I mean, if you were to give up this, uh, you could probably get this type of statement a bit easier by a compactness argument, but, uh, but that's important uh, that it has kind of, that it's natural in the sense that it has the right homogeneities. And in that respect, we get a result as if uh, um, we were dealing with uh, uh, a non-degenerate elliptic equation uh, or elliptic system in a variational form uh, where, uh, which, would, uh, which would look a little bit like this, where also uh, you, would ex you would hope for this kind of right uh, homogeneity. So it's the right homogeneity and it's the right metric for the data term, right? I mean, the, uh, we should measure smallness uh, or closeness to constants on the data side. We should measure it in the Wasserstein distance, right? That's the right metric uh, for this problem very much like the L2 distance is the right metric for more classical problems. So in that sense, uh, this, uh, this proposition, I think, is, um, is, quite, uh, is quite natural and of independent interest because it works in a very, you know, for very rough measures as, you know, now, nowadays optimal transportation uh, is popular also in manifold learning and uh, so, where you deal with point clouds. So, uh, so therefore, it's good to have such a kind of uh, result which can deal with rough measures. Um, yeah, so now let me tell you a little bit uh, 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 about the idea of the proof and that I think also makes it kind of natural. And, uh, and the idea of the proof uh, uses another uh, famous feature of uh, optimal transportation namely that uh, 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 you can see it, and that's the way I introduced it, in the Lagrangian way, but you can also see it in the Eulerian way. And uh, that's an observation uh, by uh, Jean-David Benamou and Yann Brunier. And here I, on this slide, I try to explain it. So, uh, so uh, on the, um, uh, on the uh, Lagrangian side, in a certain sense, you have this transfer plan in XY space, which gives rise to particle trajectories. I mean, trajectories uh, by which you move particles, let's say in a continuous artificial time, t is equal to zero, t is equal to one, from the positions they were initially to the positions they were later. But, uh, but such uh, particle tra trajectories can also be described in terms of a density flux pair, like in continuum mechanics. So, uh, so you have a, a pair of density and flux, which uh, satisfy what's called the continuity equation, and you monitor or you consider uh, what's uh, what would be the kinetic energy in elementary Newtonian mechanics, and uh, and then it's what was observed by uh, Benamou Brunier that the squared Wasserstein distance can be kind of completely equivalent to reformulated in kind of uh, in, as a variation problem where you minimize the kinetic energy over all pairs of density flux uh, that satisfy the continuity equation 
and where the density at the initial time is mu and the density at the final time is lambda. And now <clears throat> it's kind of clear or not surprising that this variational formulation has a major advantage when it comes to regularity theory. And the reason is that this uh, integrant here is in fact cum granum salis, almost strictly convex in both in the, in, in, in the pair rho and j. And, uh, and as we know, if we have kind of a strictly convex variational problem, uh, you know, we have chances to develop a regularity theory. Whereas the uh, Kantorovich formulation of optimal transportation is more on the uh, degenerate convex uh, side. So, uh, so this reformulation in a certain sense highlights the strict convex nature uh, of optimal transportation. And in a certain sense, it also makes immediately the connection to, uh, uh, to the Poisson, to the Laplace operator, because the only thing you have to do is you, by linearization in a certain sense, linearizing the functional, replacing one over rho j square by j square, that amounts to replacing the squared Wasserstein distance by the squared h minus one distance. So, uh, uh, so that's the, uh, that's the uh, what I think natural approach we take in order to prove regularity. And um, so here again is, uh, uh, is, the, uh, uh, is the Eulerian uh, side. So now we think in terms of uh, uh, a pair of uh, uh, density flux uh, that connects the two measures. Uh, we think of the kinetic energy as our energy. And in this reformulation, our uh, uh, our proposition, our harmonic approximation proposition really takes on this form. So again, for any tau larger than zero, uh, uh, there exists a threshold such that if energy and data are small, then there exists a harmonic gradient so that we have this property. And now you have again another interpretation of this result, namely it states that the Eulerian velocity, uh, which is uh, flux divided by density is close to a harmonic gradient. So again, something uh, something very natural in a certain sense, the particles flow along uh, uh, a vector field that's given by a harmonic gradient or stay close to a vector field that's given by a harmonic gradient. So that's, uh, that's just the reformulation at this point, but that's the way how we prove it. And, uh, and the way how we prove it, in, again, is, is, is kind of... Uh, uh, is kind of natural. Uh, in a certain sense, I have to tell you what, uh, how to get this harmonic gradient, how to get this uh, uh, function psi, which solves Laplace of, uh, uh, sorry, this function phi, which solves Laplace of phi is equal to a constant. And, uh, and you, do it, uh, you do it in the following way. So uh, um, uh, it's all about kind of flux or Neumann boundary data. So uh, the, um, if you, if I recall, if I briefly recall uh, the uh, the Eulerian formulation, so the density flux uh, pair continuity equation, in uh, but now we're in, we're looking at a cylinder, so uh, uh, this time interval zero one cross the uh, 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 cross the ball of radius r, then we have a boundary, and in a certain sense we should look at the flux uh, that flows through the boundary in and out. And uh, that's, of course, given by the normal component of the flux J, and let's call that F. And uh, so that's a function which lives on the cylinder, on the, on, on the lateral boundary of this cylinder, on the mantle of the cylinder. And now uh, it's natural to say we should take the time integral of this boundary flux, and we should take this as the Neumann boundary data for our harmonic function phi. And that's exactly what we do. So uh, in a certain sense, we integrate over time, we project onto something that's time independent, and then we get Neumann data for this problem. And we have to allow for non-zero constant because the integral over F bar in general will be non-zero. And that's, that's exactly the definition of the phi. So that's, a, I think, a very natural choice and uh, there is a little twist that you have to do that on a good radius, uh, but that's also something people in minimal surfaces 
uh, will know. So that's, uh, that's how we get this, uh, this harmonic approximation. So let me look my, look at my watch. So uh, here I kind of gave you a little bit uh, an idea of how to construct this harmonic function. Now let me tell you what, uh, you know, with this harmonic approximation, uh, what can be established. So, uh, uh, so there, in a certain sense, we can reprove things which were not so long ago famously established by Guido de Filippis and Alessio Figali, namely um, an epsilon regularity uh, uh, result for optimal transportation in, in coming in form of a Schauder theory. So we look at uh, kind of Hölder, uh, we look at uh, measures, uh, now we restrict to measures mu and lambda, which have uh, the back densities f, which uh, we suppose are Hölder continues with exponent alpha, and uh, let's normalize them. And we monitor uh, the local energy now not expressed in terms of the transference plan, but in terms directly in terms of the Brunier map, which we know to exist. And uh, so non-dimensionalized in the right way by the volume, by length square, because we have length square here. And, uh, and we, the data, well, the data is just uh, uh, the Hölder norm uh, of the two densities, F and G, uh, non-dimensionalized in the right way. And then uh, the result we get if uh, epsilon and D, so the energy and the data locally are below, uh, a, so to say, universal threshold, then we get exactly kind of the type of linear estimate one would expect, namely the, uh, 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 the C1 alpha norm of the um, uh, transport map is estimated by the C1 alpha norm of the densities or the C2 alpha norm of uh, the potential is estimated by the C1 alpha norm of the densities. So, uh, so a C2 alpha regularity theory of the Mont-Jean-Pierre equation of C1, an epsilon regularity theory. So that was exactly what, uh, what um, uh, De Filippis and Figali proved, appealing to uh, uh, um, the um, uh, maximum principal side. So here is a slide which in a certain sense explains a little bit the differences between uh, what they did and what we uh, have done afterwards. So, uh, uh, so in a certain sense, in our case, uh, the main idea is to perturb around the uh, Laplace equation, whereas uh, they're perturbing around the Mont-Jean-Pierre equation with constant right-hand side. So that's a little bit following the 92 approach of uh, Luis Caffarelli to W1P regularity for uh, the uh, Mont-Jean-Pierre equation. So, uh, so, so, the, uh, so the object we compare with is, uh, is different. Uh, they compare to the nonlinear equation. We compare right away to the linear equation. And for that reason, we get right away linear type estimates. So the right homogeneities. And also we get to see two alpha essentially in one, or in one step instead of having to bootstrap. But the biggest difference I would say is that the technique, techniques are different. Uh, so uh, uh, Filippi, uh, De Filippis and Figali use comparison principle and then connect to Caffarelli theory, whereas our, uh, our side is completely variational. So uh, more kind of novel applications is uh, work with uh, uh, Miura, uh, where uh, we do the same thing uh, for boundary regularity, uh, where in such sense we get the optimal uh, conditions on the regularity of the uh, boundary and a similar type of epsilon regularity result. I will not, in the interest of time, I will not go too much into detail. And then there is kind of perhaps a, a, a more novel application which has to do with the, uh, with the problem of matching. So uh, that's something which in fact comes more from the computer science community where you transport uh, uh, a discrete and atomic measure into either another atomic measure or uh, the Lebesgue measure. And, um, and that has been kind of a, a popular topic uh, for a while. And since uh, uh, our regularity theory uh, is completely robust, even if measures are atomic, singular in any way, uh, it's uh, it's a it's a good uh, um, it's a good tool to apply uh, to these matching problems and in a certain sense understand the uh, the large scale uh, 
regularity, large-scale linearization of that problem, uh, which kind of sheds a bit more light uh, to uh, uh, things which have been done uh, recently, for instance, by the PISA group. Uh, so, um, but let me, so I'm just going quickly over this because I, uh, in, in the past uh, five to 10 minutes, I want to tell you uh, um, uh, a little bit about uh, the, uh, uh, the proof. So, uh, so I think I, ex I hope I explained a bit why, uh, uh, why this harmonic approximation is quite natural uh, for optimal transportation, in particular, if you move to the Eulerian point of view. And uh, now I want to tell you how, uh, how this proof actually goes. And I want to do it in, a, in fact, that's how uh, Michael Goldman and I started in kind of the simple case where the two measures locally are Lebesgue measures, uh, which uh, is still non-trivial because that doesn't mean globally things are easy. So uh, there could still be kind of singularities, but uh, uh, the setup is somewhat easier to explain in this case. So, uh, so now, now we're in this uh, seemingly simple situation where both measures on the ball of radius six are uh, the Lebesgue measures, but outside they can be anything. And uh, uh, we look at the um, Eulerian formulation of optimal transportation. We look at the energy in the five ball. And uh, as I explained, uh, what's important is the uh, flux um, on the Eulerian, on the side of the Eulerian description, the flux uh, through, uh, uh, through the boundary and its time average. And as I said, uh, uh, the main step in fact is to show that there exists a radius uh, between let's say three and four, uh, which depends on the configuration, such that if you solve this uh, uh, Neumann problem for the Poisson equation on the ball of radius R, with the right time averaged flux boundary data, uh, then uh, you get a harmonic, uh, uh, a harmonic function, which is a good approximation uh, to your flux, or which provides a good approximation to the transport velocity, in the sense that you get this super linear estimate. So the important thing here is, now it's not formulated in terms of a tau, but it's much more explicit, uh, the important thing is that uh, the, uh, um, what you have on the right-hand side is a, strictly, a power strictly larger than one of E, which is good if E is small, right? Then if E is small, then this is even much smaller because you take a power which is larger than one. So that's in a certain sense, in a nutshell, in a simple situation, uh, the main result. And so how, what, what, are the, uh, what are the ingredients for such a result? So here again, it's stated, uh, you have this super linear estimate where you uh, monitor the difference between uh, the Eulerian velocity and the harmonic gradient uh, by a super linear power of the, uh, uh, of, the transportation, uh, of the transportation cost. So first step, of course, is the construction of phi that are, I told you already what it is. Uh, you solve this uh, uh, Neumann problem uh, for so the natural boundary condition problem for the uh, for the uh, Poisson equation, the second step in a certain sense uses the strict convexity which I mentioned of this variation problem, which translates into an orthogonality property. So we we always do that implicitly when we deal with kind of quadratic variation problems. We always can say when we have a kind of a quadratic variation problem that the distance between the minimizer and a kind of competitor, the square distance is estimated by the energy gap. So if we, if, we, if we can construct a competitor that's close in energy, then we know that also the configurations are close. That's kind of typical for quadratic variation problems of a strict variation, strictly convex variation problems, and this type of orthogonality and in fact, it also holds for this problem. And uh, in, in, at least in the simple case, because then we can appeal to McCann's displacement convexity, uh, which gives this clean inequality. So everything now resides in kind of reduces to uh, constructing um, uh, a competitor. 
So uh, 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 a pair uh, of density flux uh, that uh, um, uh, is not much larger than the Dirichlet, where the cost is not much larger than the Dirichlet energy of this uh, harmonic function, not much larger in the sense, in the super linear sense. And, uh, and uh, the main difficulty or the main task in constructing this, uh, this competitor uh, resides in the fact that in a certain sense, you took somewhat the wrong boundary condition for the Poisson equation because you averaged the flux. And so you kind of ignore the time resolved structure of the function f. So you need kind of a boundary layer that connects the uh, time resolved flux through the boundary f to the time averaged flux to the boundary. And that's best done in the boundary layer. And, uh, and then you use kind of a tra suitable trace estimate or um, uh, an iso lower dimensional isoparametric principle, which is just another way of saying a trace estimate, which, uh, uh, which deals with this additional boundary layer and which in the end gives rise to, uh, uh, to the strange looking dimensional dependent exponent. But in the end, it's not strange, it comes out uh, by the nature of isoparametry uh, on the cylinder mantle. And, uh, and in that sense, uh, what we're doing is really very close to uh, what people have done in case of minimal surfaces, in particular, uh, we're thinking of the work by, uh, by Schön and Simon, uh, where uh, the main step is to approximate a minimal surface by a harmonic graph. Here we approximate the optimal displacement by a harmonic gradient. And, um, and in both cases, one just uses that the object of interest, either minimal surfaces or optimal transportation is minimizing under compact perturbations. And both approaches, at least in this approach, don't use the Euler-Lagrange equation, the first variation. And uh, the main difficulty in both cases, in a certain sense, is a mismatch of boundary conditions. Uh, for the construction of the harmonic competitor. In the minimal surface case, it's the fact that you don't know a priori that your minimal surface is a graph. So you have to kind of glue uh, something which is a graph into something which is not necessarily graph. And there you have to, uh, yeah, there you're, uh, you have errors. And here in our case, it's the difference between time averaged and time resolved. And in both cases, you appeal to lower dimensional isoparametric estimates and to, uh, uh, to choices of a good radius to, uh, to, do the, to do the job. And in both cases, in the end, crucially, you appeal to strict convexity to, as I said, convert an energy gap into, uh, uh, into a distance between the competitor and the, your uh, minimizing configuration. So, uh, so a, lot of, uh, a lot of parallel uh, uh, analog uh, steps uh, between minimal surface theory and uh, optimal transportation. So I guess I'm almost done. That's just, uh, that's just one slide which tells you that once you have this uh, harmonic approximation, how you can feed it into a Campanato iteration. Uh, um, uh, 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 but, uh, and that, okay, two slides. Uh, uh, what the difficulties are when you consider rough measures and, uh, uh, but uh, I think since my time is done, uh, let me, uh, and since you may also ask questions, so let me uh, summarize. So, uh, uh, so I, I, I um, my, my, my goal was to tell you about this, uh, uh, about this different approach to regularity in optimal transportation uh, with connections to regularity of the Mont-Jean-Pierre equation which uh, uh, works via um, harmonic approximation and is purely variational. And in fact, has, uh, has uh, uh, large similarities with uh, 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 what's done for minimal surfaces. And um, uh, I've given you briefly mentioned kind of applications which are uh, uh, somewhat novel or which are novel, uh, kind of boundary regularity, the matching problem. In fact, uh, uh, we recently extended uh, this from uh, uh, the Euclidean cost function to a more general cost function, exactly uh, the way um, uh, De Filippis and Figali assumed it 
And uh, what we want to work on more is kind of this matching problem, in particular the two-dimensional case and the, uh, and the thermodynamic limit. So I guess uh, at this uh, point, I would like to stop. And yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Otto. Thank you so much. I'm clapping for all the attendees, of course. And uh, uh, are there any questions by the audience? by the attendees. Okay, so I have several questions. Uh, so, okay, you are more interested in general cost functions, but I see that actually, uh, so the, the harmonic approximation is really because you have the W2 Wasserstein distance, which you can relate through the Benamour Brenier uh, uh, formulation or equivalent renovation. So if you would use now the, the, the P Wasserstein distance, and there is of course also the characterization by Benamou and Brenier, then you would actually uh, look for a P harmonic function. Is this right? I think that's, in principle, that sounds plausible. I think that's something uh, one should look into. I haven't thought much about it, but uh, but I think that's plausible here. When I, when I mentioned uh, general cost functions, um, uh, I was thinking of um, the same setup as in the Philippus Figali, which means you're thinking of cost functions which very locally are quadratic mm -hmm. or look like quadratic functions, uh, which would be the case if you're doing optimal transportation on a Riemannian manifold. So, uh, so that would be, in a certain sense, you would still be in the basin of attraction of the Euclidean case, yeah. and you can deal, uh, you can, uh, uh, you can deal with it in a certain sense by perturbation, like uh, you know, non-constant coefficient equations can be dealt with by constant coefficient theory through perturbation. So that's the same, that's the same spirit. Uh, what you're alluding to is really a different class because now you change the scaling, right? And, uh, and I think that's an interesting question where this can be done. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a natural I question. Know. I mean, uh, you are in the case P equals two. Yes. And uh, then of course it's natural also to ask uh, in what sense what happens with the W uh, P distance. Yes, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Are there any questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. um, can you explain a little bit more what the matching problem is actually, the matching Poisson to Lebesgue? I did okay, not I really can, understand what this means. Yes, I can say a couple of words on this. So, um, uh, so, um, so you're, um, um, you're looking at uh, kind of uh, a, a singular measure, which is kind of a, a sum of Dirac's. Mm -hmm. And the and the position of the Dirac's is random, and uh, the position these points are uh, given by what's uh, called the uh, Poisson point process. So it's in a certain sense the most random way you can kind of arrange points with constant, let's say, constant density. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a it's a random measure. I see. And, uh, um, and now a classical problem is you have, you, uh, um, you, um, you have two of these random point clouds and you want to have, uh, you know, matching like in the marriage problem, you want to have one-to-one -one matching between the points mm -hmm. and you want to do it in a, in a so, so, so to say, optimal way. Oh. Um, that's, that's the matching problem. And, uh, uh, and now here, uh, we're as it's you know we're not the, not not the first to look at this modification, but uh, that's also quite common to replace uh, to look just at one discrete measure, random discrete measure, and on the other hand to look at the uniform density, mm -hmm. and then uh, then in a certain sense you would get an interesting pattern up here. Now I drew a one-dimensional picture, but of course this is more interesting in uh, 
in higher dimensions where up here you would have these convex cells uh, where all the mass is transported into a single point. I see. And you would have kind of this random tessellation of, uh, um, of the surface. And, uh, um, and now, you, now you, in a certain sense, you want to understand the large scale behavior. In particular, you want to understand it in the, uh, so the particularly interesting case is the two dimensional case. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because there, it turns out that uh, your transportation distance diverges logarithmically as you make the, uh, the size larger and larger. So interest, interestingly, in two dimensions, uh, the cell and the point to which all the mass gets transported are pretty far apart. And uh, 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 so, uh, so yeah, there are and there's kind of a connection to what's called the Gaussian free field behavior. Therefore, the 2D case is special. So that's that's the matching problem. Okay, thank you. There's. Uh, also, Professor Giga, who has a question, and he has no permission no. to speak. Okay, I have a very small question. Uh, you mentioned about uh, local data size square, but I do not understand your notation D. You say D is a sum. Oh, yeah, here you have a, you have, you have, you have your D control of D, right? But yeah, let me let me. is major. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let me go to uh, about your notation. So what is uh, kappa? Mu kappa is, is a constant. Kappa, kappa is, a, constant. Kappa, constant kappa is a constant. Kappa is a constant measure. Yes. So constant measure. So, I see. I see. Yes. So so I so see. in a certain sense, d me, d measures uh, uh -huh. square distance to a constant to constant densities. Ah, uh -huh. mm -hmm. I see. I see. Okay, but Without it's the Lebesgue measure with a constant k. Is this right? Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So uh, I see. So it's so a, have, it's a it's a it's a it's a way of measuring uh, mm -hmm. the right distance to constants. I see. I see. So, so, so that's a, that's 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 perhaps one of the differences with the maximum base theory, which mm -hmm. also kind of looks at kind of uh, um, uh, measures mu and lambda. But the, the maximum base theory always has to assume that uh, you have densities f and g, which are bounded away from zero and infinity. Uh, and I see. Here, uh, here, this is much more robust. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, we could not, we weren't, we would not be in the position to apply, it, for instance, to the matching problem. So this quantity is the key quantity in your analysis, right? This, this is, is one of the key. This is one key of the bundle key bundle quantities. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. I see. I see. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Are there other questions by the attendees? Other questions? If not, uh, all the attendees and also the speaker has received, should have received an email from us about the coffee break. And I warmly invite you to join us and you can ask uh, uh, more questions directly face to face via Zoom, of course, unfortunately only, uh, to the speaker and also uh, maybe some uh, rather social questions. And uh, I would then, let's join me to thank the speaker again. Uh, Professor Atta, thank you so much for this wonderful talk and for answering the questions we, which you have. And uh, I would then now uh, close the session. Felix, are you still there? Yes, so I will go to the other session, right? Yes, okay, great. Okay, I close the session now. Thank you again. You're welcome, thank you. Bye.